Well, thank you, Russell, first, and for inviting me. I might say of all the places that I talk and lecture, most people do not talk about human resources and what it takes to be successful. I'd like to start off with what Napoleon said on his thoughts on help. Then I'll get into my lecture. I try to find smart, lazy people. They make excellent assistance. The smart, energetic people are our other leaders and are too busy to help. The lazy and stupid are unable to help, and the energetic and stupid should be shot. <laughs> and there are an awful lot of energetic people out there who don't understand customers and what it's all about. Now, on the advertisement for this session, it said, learning from CEOs, authors, and experts. Well, I've been a CEO, I've been an author, and I'm not sure I'm an expert, but let me tell you what it is that I believe accomplishes success. You know, in golf, they always say, what's the secret? There is no secret, but in retailing, there is a secret. And the secret is customer service, to the nth degree. Now, I started my retail career as a page boy in 1938 at a store called Bon Motella, where Trump towers today. And I was hired because I fit a uniform for the Christmas shop. And after that, they put me on the door. And the door was to assist the doorman. My wife always says he wasn't the doorman, he was assisting the doorman. <laughs> and as I opened the door, I realized the Paysons, the Whitneys, the Vanderbilts, the Lehmans, what they drove up in their chauffeur's limousines, they loved to be greeted by, good morning, Mrs. Payson, good morning, Mrs. Stone. The name recognition I realized when I was 17 years old is the key to success. People love to hear their name. And the same thing applies to a customer coming into a store. Now let me talk a bit about why I call finding a gold mine in a lost art of customer service. Customer service is a lost art. I would believe that customers should be treated as valued assets to be treasured. And let this roll around in your mind a bit. A customer walking in the store, or even on the internet, they want to spend money. And the question is, how do you get them to spend money? If you ignore them, they're not going to spend money. There was a time before and possibly as late as the 1950s when retailers and other business executives were aware of the need for customer service as being superior as in having the right merchandise on their shelves. No use having the right stock if you have the wrong salespeople. These innovative business people treated each other and every customer as a valued asset. A valued asset. How much is this customer worth? Knowing through many years of experience with superior customer service, well-trained and dedicated staffs, it was a great potential available for the customer to spend beyond their initial intent, which is known as trading up. There's a story, I think, in the book that you have on page 244. Stanley Marcus, who ran Neiman Marcus for many years and made it what it is today, a customer came in when standing on the floor and said she'd like to buy a tie for her husband. And Stanley picked out a tie. And she loved it. He said, let me show you a shirt that goes with that tie. And she loved the shirt. Let me show you, show you a suit that goes with the shirt and the tie. And so a suit, a coat, a hat, and God knows what. Now, it may be just a legend that never took place. But the principle of being able to do multiple selling is a lost art today because of self-service. In the around 1950s, self-service developed. As I saw it starting in the discount stores and gradually crept into department stores, specialty stores soon followed, particularly those who featured wearing apparel. Thus, we arrive at the point in the department store and specialty store floors and merchandise described, as you all heard, it's called Rack City. You walk and you walk, you see merchandise and merchandise. You rarely see a salesperson today. It was always about this time that many independent retailers were absorbed by public entities. Big companies were buying them. Their major objective, among other priorities, of course, would be the bottom line. In the process, dedicating experience and sales force people became the first casualties. In addition, retailers, particularly shopping malls, developed and decided if they opened seven days a week, 24 hours a day, as they pay rent for that time, they'd have sales people there also. They brought about what are called staggered hours. This meant spreading the minimum number of salespeople around in order to have what they call adequate coverage, which I call inadequate coverage. There are cash registered ringers and credit card swipers. The result was lost out of customer service. There was no salesmanship. It is equivalent. i will always use an example. If you're driving your car and you see the gas meter going down slowly, you don't stop the car and take the spark plugs out and remove it and say, well, I'll take four out and maybe it'll get there. The car will die. And the same thing happens in salespeople. 
I know in Sports Authority, two years ago, I went looking for something for my home. I couldn't find a sale people, I found a stockman, he's just maybe, and I took it, it was wrong. I brought it back. There was no problem exchanging it, but I saw a man in a red jacket, I said, the manager here. He's on the manager, where are your sales people? Oh, business went bad, we got rid of all the sales people. Idiocy, doesn't work. <laughs> now let's talk about discovering, developing a gold mine, a good example of business that learned and treat customers as valued assets, and a few of them and far in between. I came to Bergdorf Goodman in 1970. The store was doing $38 million in the greatest piece of real estate in New York City or the USA, and they asked if I could maintain and help build that business. Do you realize today the 38 million has turned into 800 million? I left the 205 million, and then my predecessor took it on. I also had the good fortune, if you remember FAO Schwartz, moved across the street, and a building became available, and they said, do you want the building? And I'm so smart, I said, no. I <laughs> wanted a theater behind Bergdorf, but that was not available, I took it. We put in men's. My claim to fame is I have built the largest men's store on Fifth Avenue. As a kid, I would never believe that would have happened. That store by itself is close to $80 million, maybe 90, which means the combination in a few years will be a billion dollars. Profitable, high fashion, merchandise with a reputation that no one can touch. There are very few stores today that offer what I call a customer service. There was a two-page spread in Sunday's New York Times, I think it was on Macy's, of uh, eight, $400 million expansion. They talked about everything, merchandise, new floors, this and this. They did not, and the chairman is a good friend of mine, he did not talk about customer service. He talked about maybe 2,000 more salespeople, good luck to them. Unless they're trained to treat the customer the way you want to be treated, forget it. And that's where the loss of business has, has come from. People say, well, is there a store? that caters beyond the Bergdorf Urban. Nordstrom. It, Nordstrom is the exception to the rule. It should not be the exception to the rule. It should be generally the same if a customer walks in, there's a person there, they do it on the computer, on the internet. But the problem is many business executives today, this generation, never learned nor understood the rewards of customer service as results have well continued to suffer the consequences. They suffer the consequence of limited sales and profit. Today, in my opinion, if large companies would devote a major portion of their promotional budget to develop dedicated, well-trained salespeople personnel instead of massive and expensive advertising campaigns, their returns would be the equivalent of the proverbial gold mine. Let's take as an example, Circuit City Stores. Five years ago, pretty profitable company. They decided, or the CEO, remember what I said about Napoleon? He should have been taken out and shot. The CEO decided we should reduce the sale of people because they're too expensive and bring in people who are not. Stock that day went from 8 to 40, and as you know, a year later, they went bankrupt out of business. The New York Times, Sears Roebuck, five years ago, four years ago, decided to spend 50 to $75 million for an advertising campaign. I knew one of the former CEOs, I said, where's the, where's the money, what are they going to talk about? They don't have merchandise proper, they don't have service, they don't have anything. If you start blowing money into advertising, it's, it's making the customer more irritated, wasting time and money on Sears, of course, since that time has gone way, way down where they, frankly, no hard feelings they deserve to be. I resent, <laughs> I resent professionals who represent themselves as retailers who don't know what the devil they're doing. You take the J.C. Penney. I went to a dinner party and uh, black tie dinner party about four years ago, and I was introduced to one of the big investors, which J.C. Penney, and he very proudly said, what do you think of our hiring Johnson? And I'm trying to be very subtle. I said, you made a tremendous mistake. It's not gonna work. Can we have lunch and talk about it? There's nothing to talk about. He's the wrong guy. Well, as you all know, it went from here to here to here. The guy had a great new idea, but not for J.C. Penney. It should have been somewhere, someplace else. They've then rehired the guy who went in before, also known quite well, and he'll be there for a while, and they'll eventually come back if they pay attention to their business. I'm going to say something to you now that I have a definition of a customer. Now, if you think I think the customer is important, I wouldn't be here tonight without the customers. I wouldn't be in business without the customer. My salespeople wouldn't be in business without the customers. And the company that owns Neiman Marcus and Bergdorf Goodman. Neiman's is now about four billion dollars. Bergdorf's close to one billion. We're talking about five billion dollars which five or six years ago was nowhere near that figure. 
So the business is there. I'd like to, if I'm not boring you, it's a little long, but it's very important. The following definition of what is a customer, and it's anonymous. I don't know who it is, but it was on my desk every day, and I pass it around to my employees to make sure you pay attention. I might add, if I, if I saw, this is one store, of course, on Fifth Avenue. If I saw a customer ask a salesperson, where is such and such, and she'd say, I take it by the arm, and so break your arm. You walk the customer over and show what she wants. She wants to spend money. Our customer is the most important person in our business. The most important person in the business. Not the CEO, not the chairman, customer. The customer is not dependent on us. We are dependent on the customer. The customer is not an interest of our work. The customer is the purpose of. You walk in the store and see two salespeople talking and trying to break them up, good luck. <laughs> a customer does, a, does us a favor when they come in. We are not doing customers a favor by waiting on them. A customer is part of a business. They are not an outsider. A customer is not just money in the cash register. A customer is a human being with feelings and deserves to be treated with respect. A customer is a person who comes to us with their needs and their wants. It is our job to fill them. Customers deserve the most courteous attention we can give them. A customer is the lifeblood of our very business. A customer pays our salary. Without a customer, we would have to close our shop. Don't ever forget it. And those were the dictums that we had in my running a business. This is how it has to be run, and I don't want anybody to mess around. If you do, don't like it, go work for the competition. You can be, they'd be better over there. If you think I was tough, I was called a benevolent dictator. <laughs> you could do whatever you wanted to do in the store as long as I agreed with it. It worked. <laughs> Earning customer loyalty was, for me, like religion. It would be practiced every day. I was brought up by a woman in a store in Hartford, Connecticut. It was called G. Fox & Company. The woman was Beatrice Fox Auerbach. She was this big. She was 70 years old. And she took me under a wing that I should run her store for her. I worked for her for 10 years. If I took my shirt up, I'd show you a back square. She whacked me over the back every day. Get on the floor. The customer's on the floor. The customer's not in the office. I was very smart. They used to have escalators up and down, so I had a podium like this where the floor mount used to be, and I'd stand there until she went to the floor, and she said, Mr. Neymar is always on the floor. That's what she wanted, and that's what she got. Today, I'm afraid that many CEOs have lost connecting with their customers. They have, due to multiple stores and businesses, delegated what I consider their responsibility to, to staff. Terry Lundgren, who I mentioned a moment ago, is opening the Macy's with the $400 million expansion, has a store in um, Connecticut, Stanford, where I go for my accountant, and there's a parking garage where Macy's parking garage. So I go through there, and last year I walked through and I went to the store to see how, what's going on. No salespeople, and more importantly, there was only one salesperson in the cosmetic department. And as you all know, cosmetic people supply their own people. So I asked this one person, Were well, your salespeople? Oh, they come in later when it gets busy. I walked to the store, I saw a man with a marking machine. I said, where, are your, where are your employees in the men's department? Oh, they let them go. This, and Terry's a smart guy. He worked for Neiman Marcus. He should know better, but he runs a thousand stores today. If you think that I'm being unduly critical, please walk from store to store and business to business. And what you will find in most cases, failed associates, many not too well trained, and not know how to make more than one sale if they make that one sale. The solution. Every CEO and every manager should delegate at least one day out of a very busy schedule to walk one of their stores. Officially, I prefer unannounced, and this is called getting a degree in, a degree in MBWA. It's called management by walking around. <laughs> you know when you walk to a store, I, there's one store I won't mention, I, they sell my book, and I said, have CEO been through here lately? And no, he stays in his office. I don't understand. As a matter of fact, a good example is an executive whose name I prefer not to mention ran 52 stores. We had lunch, and I said, Phil, whoop, gave his name. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Phil, you have a company, a corporate jet, and you have 50 stores. If you had the corporate jet, you could visit one store a week for 52 weeks. And what happens is the store takes a week to get ready for you. The week you're there, or the day rather, you're there. They're all excited, and when they leave, you've left a big impression. And he said it was a great idea. Unfortunately, he never did it. Carter Holy Hale lost the business eventually. And the, and the business went to other companies, but they still don't pay attention. So my, my recommendation uh, to this group today, no matter what position you have, 
but if you have supervision, please walk around and see if the people are operating the way you want to. Don't get stuck in an office. Remember Beatrice Fox, our, our back, and the whip marks on my back. Get out on the floor, Mr. Neymark, the customer's on the floor. She is not in your office. If the CEOs know their business and are walking true, would show, are the salespeople associated and available with the customers? Are the salespeople addressed how the CEO sees his business? Now, this is one of my great irritations. As I walk through some stores, whether it's Saks Fifth Avenue or whatever, it used to be 50, 60, 70 years ago, stores were given discounts to their employees. The discount was given so the employee could buy clothes in the store to look proper. Well, today, they don't care. They give the discount, and this, I walked through some stores. I was over to the CEO, the CEO of Saks Fifth Avenue about five or six years ago. There was a man in the cosmetic department dressed like he was in a circus. I said, how could you allow a man representing your store look like that for a customer? Well, we better check it. He should have checked it beforehand. <laughs> uh, sale people busy talking with each other instead of paying attention to customers who pay the store's bills, including the salaries. As a matter of fact, I made a mistake because walking through Bergdorf Grimm and I see these people on cell phones. What are they talking on cell phones? And I raised hell, I told the CEO, and he said, no, we give all the sale people cell phones to contact, contact the customers. Maybe this is good, maybe it's not, I'm not sure. As retailing continues to expand nationally and ever internationally, customer loyalty must be built into the store just as surely as bricks and mortar and not, and not as an afterthought. Now, I also lecture at Columbia Business School. Invariably, after I finish explaining retailing, one student gets up and says, Mr. Neymark, you explained retailing very well, but you haven't told us how the internet's going to put the retail stores out of business. I say, thank you for asking that question. It's like it was planted. <laughs> what happens is, as long as a store creates a customer experience, example, I usually say, have you been to the Apple store on Fifth Avenue? Oh, yes. Is it busy? Every day. 24 hours a day. I said, do you know why? Why? Greatest assortment of merchandise I've ever seen. Greatest number of salespeople, knowledgeable salespeople, who know what's going on. But it's also, every one of those customers has a computer. They wouldn't be there. So they walk in because they want what is called a customer experience, something that is happening. And that's what Lundgren did with Macy's now, of spending his 400 million, creating a whole new feeling for the store. Sure, they do maybe 10% in internet, maybe higher. But he's gonna have traffic to the store like they never saw before. And the buying experience is created by a sales staff that makes a person welcome. I read quickly in the, in the Times this morning, hotels now have worked out where you can go to your room directly with a, with a cell phone. Well, it used to be a time, good morning, Mr. Neymark, Welcome, we have your room ready for you. It doesn't have to be an expensive room, but someone should recognize who you are, mention your name, we will take care of you. The difference is it's over there. You lose a sale. When customers say customer service on the internet, better than many retailers. The guilt group is number one. When you have a problem with guilt group, return it, take care of it, we'll take care of you. I met the principals and they people, they start a guilt group by being down in the village one day and seeing 200 people online to get into a sample sale. So he said, this is a good idea. I can get 2 million people online, which he did, and they're, and they're in business today. A final example of what bothers me terribly and possibly bothers you. I say it is puzzling. It really isn't puzzling. It's annoying. Where a successful business will spend millions and millions of advertising dollars to enhance their image. I'm talking major blue chip companies every day in the New York Times, any magazine. And throw much of the money away, angry and frustrated customer ask them, push button, push one, push two, push three, good luck to you and the Boston Braves, as we used to say. <laughs> My feeling is with voice recognition, it wouldn't be more worthwhile than spending so many advertising dollars to have a telephone operator instead say, with voice recognition, good morning, Mr. Neymark, how might I help you? That's what I call customer service. Thank you. Ooh. Mm -hmm.